night. Tillerson meets Putin. Aid arrives in Somalia. And the maple syrup mafia. This is gonna fucking end in disaster, isn't it? The Sacramento Police Department has launched a criminal investigation into one of its own officers after cell phone video surfaced of him severely beating a black man, apparently after stopping him for jaywalking. Sacramento Police also released dash cam video of the incident. The officer is on paid leave. Calls for South African President Jacob Zuma to resign came to a head today, on his 75th birthday. Thousands of people from across the political spectrum protested in the capital. Zuma has been implicated in several corruption scandals and has presided over record unemployment during his eight years in office. Zuma, I want to rule this country like all these African countries. And this is not uh, that kind of country. Syria's government and rebels swapped prisoners today under tight security. It's the first step toward implementing a deal facilitated by Iran and Qatar to evacuate up to 60,000 civilians from four towns that have been under siege for two years. President Trump just lifted the federal hiring freeze he imposed in January, but there's a caveat. Government agencies have to submit a plan by June 30th outlining how they're going to shrink their staffs. The White House is also asking the public for help in reorganizing the executive branch. Give us your ideas and help us fix your government so that it serves you instead of the other way around. President Trump backtracked on one of his core campaign promises today, telling the Wall Street Journal that he won't label China as a currency manipulator. He also said during the interview that the dollar is too strong. That caused its value to drop steeply in trading this afternoon. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and President Vladimir Putin met in Moscow today to work on a relationship that's quickly sliding toward crisis. Usually when top diplomats convene, they project optimism, even when everyone knows it's fake. Not today. I express the view that the current state of U.S.-Russia relations is at a low point. There is a low level of trust between our two countries. There's good reason for the icy tone. The two countries have stark differences on most major issues. First and foremost, the brutal war in Syria. Josh Hirsch reports from Moscow. The big question in Moscow today was never if the U.S. and Russia were going to continue their public spat in private. It was whether either side actually had the leverage they needed to bring about changes in Syria. Despite the bluster of the past few days, the core principles of Putin and Trump aren't really so far apart. Prioritizing the fight against ISIS and leaving the nuisance of the Assad regime for somewhere down the line. But what's emerged of late is that as bad as the war in Syria has been for the U.S., it might actually be worse for the Russians. Putin has sent an estimated 10,000 troops into that conflict, any more, and he risks turning it into an outright land war. And he's been spending, according to estimates, some $4 million a day in the fight, much more than that, and he'll do further damage to an already depleted economy. I asked Alexander Goltz, an independent Russian military analyst, what he's learned over the past few days. He says that one lesson is that when it comes to taking on the U.S., the Russian toolkit is dangerously empty. It's no doubt, not a doubt for me that we are in a situation of new Cold War now. But uh, Russia has no resources Soviet Union had. What we have? We have nuclear weapons. And uh, the worst case scenario will be when both guys will begin to rise stakes uh, in this field. Do you think Putin feels threatened by the things that Secretary Tillerson has been saying or Trump have been saying about Syria, or should he? Of course he should. He should be threatened. But the right question will be, shall all of us be scared of what's, what's going on? And my assumption is that, uh, my perception is 
that we should be scared. So how does that so play out? The field uh, for diplomacy is very near narrow now. I cannot imagine that uh, any breakthrough uh, can, uh, are possible now in our relationship. I think uh, the deep, deep stagnation will be the best case scenario here. Before the strikes, Putin hinted that he wasn't totally wedded to Assad's future. But he is wedded to his own. And if the Americans do insist that Assad goes, well, Putin might dig in his heels more. And the stagnation is only getting started. The White House officially extended the National Emergency Declaration in Somalia today, citing the continued threat that al-Shabaab and other armed groups pose to the region and to American interests. But that violence is only compounding a larger threat facing the people of Somalia. This week, the UN raised the alarm level on the hunger crisis hitting the countries in the Horn of Africa. Half the population, or 6.2 million people, now need humanitarian assistance to survive. Gianna Taboni reports from southern Somalia on how a few brave public health officials are delivering desperately needed aid to a remote village. <laughs> Dr. Hodan Ali travels to small villages like Wajid to assess how severely they're affected by the drought and to determine their most immediate needs. There's more people coming from nearby towns who um, have no access to um, any other treatment facilities. Wajid is one of the most desperate villages in southern Somalia, in part because the territory surrounding it is controlled by al-Shabaab, an al-Qaeda affiliate. So the only way to get supplies in is by airdrop. If the area is about 100,000 people living yeah. um, within 80 kilometer, kilometer proximity, and you only have a few functional facilities with minimal staff and minimal supplies, you can anticipate um, the outcomes, unless we do something. Dr. Hodam was born in Somalia, but spent her entire childhood in Canada. She recently moved back to her home country after 25 years to open primary care centers. She now works with Somalia's National Drought Committee. Okay. We're here to really do an assessment in terms of what the status of these community treatment centers are to deal with the outbreaks of cholera that we have uh, witnessed in the last four to five weeks. We're going to go to the Maternal Child Health Center. Daily they get about 200 people coming to this little town to access the little services that they have. Okay, mashallah. Okay, mashallah. Okay, this one facility and these few nurses serve around 100,000 people in this area. If you see, this is the maternity ward. One bed with no other facility, no other equipment um, available. With a uh, scale, no medicines, no oxygen tanks, no emergency kits. Dr. Hodan is recommending that this town receive a new medical facility, a greater number of health professionals, and increased access to food and medicine. UNICEF has tried to send more aid to Wajid, but they were only able to land four other flights since the drought started. And even when relief does arrive, there's a constant threat of disruption from al-Shabaab. So we have to leave as soon as possible. Al-Shabaab is in the area and they know that um, supplies are being delivered and might be an opportunity for them to come and um, make an attack. 
when there are conditions like this, there's a response from the international community and local governments, but then that attracts negative attention as well from al-Shabaab. Tech firms use the H-1B visa to hire the best talent from around the world. The program has been criticized for allowing firms to pay workers lower wages. But now the Trump administration is trying to make it much more difficult to get an H-1B visa in the first place. And Silicon Valley is starting to mobilize. I felt I feel like we're the same age, but I feel like you're more advanced in life than I am. Oh uh, no, uh, I'm 27. Oh, yeah. Oh my God, you're younger. <laughs> Animesh Garg is an award-winning postdoctoral student in robotics at Stanford University with a PhD from UC Berkeley, and now he's looking for jobs. Last year, Garg was only considering roles in the U.S. This year, he's hoping for anywhere else. So right now, when you're applying, are you looking at jobs in Vancouver? Are you looking at jobs in London? Definitely. Why not? And uh, you wouldn't have before. Yeah. Earlier, it wasn't as much of the case. But now, if, if I can be guaranteed a much more peaceful life, and when I don't have to worry about all of the bureaucracy at this stage of career, uh, I would want to. Where would you consider? I think uh, the top options outside of U.S. would be Canada, Singapore, uh, and Europe. Uh, particularly Germany and UK. The election of Donald Trump and the increase in anti-immigration policies and rhetoric have coincided with the UC system seeing its first drop in foreign student applications in over a decade. When the whole rhetoric is, is so negative about, about such things and there is no support, uh, you don't feel that you belong here. The H-1 visa category designed to attract skilled workers was created in 1952. Some of the first recipients were expert Basque sheep herders. Congress created the H-1B category with the Immigration Act of 1990 for skilled workers like scientists and engineers. In 2013, Marco Rubio argued in front of the Senate for increasing the cap to 300,000 foreign workers. I, for one, have no fear that our country is going to be overrun by PhDs. The latest immigration policy from the Trump administration aims squarely at H-1B visas. U.S. citizenship and immigration services will increase site visits and no longer considers being a computer programmer a specialty skill. The H-1B program does have documented problems. According to the Economic Policy Institute, laws allowed two employers to pay H-1B workers at rates up to 41% cheaper than the average. Silicon Valley, though, relies on H-1Bs, which fill an estimated 13% of American technology jobs, making any threat to the program an issue for tech companies. Small groups of determined people can change the world. Now is the time that tech stands up. You don't often see protests in Palo Alto, or VCs trying to stir up a crowd. But on March 14th, Valley engineers took over downtown Palo Alto in a demonstration called Tech Stands Up. Granted, this is what counts for a raucous protest here. I run a VC firm on Sand Hill Road, and prior to that I spent 12 years in various executive roles at Cisco. But most importantly, I too am an immig immigrant. How big of an issue would it be for Silicon Valley if the H-1B program were yanked? Um, you automatically will cancel more than two-thirds of my meetings. I mean, look at the history from Andy Grove of Intel to, you know, Sergey Brin and to and Steve Jobs, son of a Syrian immigrant. So Silicon Valley is a story of immigration and immigrants. We have an extreme shortage of talented individuals. That's why we have to recruit from all over the world. Let's say the H-1B visa program got mm -hmm. scrapped. I think it would be uh, extremely detrimental to our industry if uh, you know things like the H-1B visa were taken away. This has provided an opening for foreign recruiters. The Canadian startup True North is advertising an H-1B worker relocation package. If the clampdown works and students like Ani Mesh go, the valley will change. If this keeps on going for a long enough period of time, then, then Silicon Valley as a whole may stand to lose its advantage, the talent advantage. No hate, no fear. Refugees are welcome. 
Changes to immigration policy are just one piece of the Trump administration's rewiring of the federal government. Also on the docket is changing the way it treats student loans. Last year, the Obama administration told the Federal Student Aid Office to make it easier for students to avoid defaulting on their debts. The new education secretary, Betsy DeVos, just rescinded that policy. Roberto Ferdman has more. Betsy DeVos's first memorandum to the Federal Student Aid Office rescinded Obama's student loan policy. Her memo is only 344 words long, but it's a pretty clear indication of how she plans to deal with the country's student debt crisis. Obama's focus centered almost entirely on protecting student borrowers. Last July, in a 51-page policy memo, his education secretary, Ted Mitchell, addressed five main target areas. All of them focused on deficiencies in the way loan service providers, the middlemen between the federal government and student borrowers, work. The main idea was to financially reward providers that offered good service and help borrowers pay off their debts. DeVos says the previous administration's proposals are full of shortcomings. The clearest criticism she offers is a suggestion that they weren't reached with precision, timeliness, or transparency. She says we have a duty to do right by both borrowers and taxpayers. Barmak Nasirian, the director of policy analysis at the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, says DeVos's letter reflects the Trump administration's tendency to side with the industry instead of the people. What most people don't realize is that some of the most basic protections you expect when uh, dealing with consumer credit, with, with mortgages, are missing when it comes to student loans. You would think that you're entitled to absolute accuracy in your accounts. You would think you're entitled to having payments made credited to your account. Unfortunately, that is not so. These changes are important now, but they'll be even more important in 2019 when the current round of federal contracts with loan service providers ends. With new rules, a new raft of companies will enter the market. Navient, which currently services more than $300 billion in student debt, is already a finalist. It's also currently being sued by the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau for prioritizing profits at the expense of college students. Navient denies any wrongdoing. The cost of oil currently hovers around $50 a barrel. Barrels of maple syrup, on the other hand, sell for around $1,200. That's because Quebec, which produces 71% of the world's supply, forces maple syrup producers to sell to an officially sanctioned OPEC-like cartel known locally as the Federation. But the Federation's high prices and rigid control have led to a booming black market for syrup, a multi-million dollar syrup heist, and accusations that Quebec is in cahoots with a syrup mafia. And now, a band of maple rebels out to destroy the Federation. Normand Urban is a fifth generation maple syrup producer. Every year we have to tap uh, a new tree, a new hole inside a tree. This is a vacuum system. This year we've had to kind of do two rounds to tap the trees. You get to know them by name. <laughs> when we started, we were uh, using buckets, the traditional system. Now everything is state of the art and uh, the industry is doing very well, selling a lot of maple syrup, a great part thanks to the uh, Maple Federation which I'm a proud member of. Uh, here is some deer. This is Canada, guys. FPAC, or the Federation, is the OPEC of maple syrup. The jewel of the maple syrup producers of Quebec. Producers in the province banded together under one umbrella organization to set and stabilize the price of syrup, which is achieved by a strict quota system on production. That means the Federation determines how many of your trees can be tapped. If you produce too much, like OPEC, the barrels end up in the strategic maple syrup reserve, and you aren't paid for excess syrup until it hits the market. But if you don't want to join the Federation, you're out of luck. If your business is maple syrup, membership is mandatory. 
This is gonna fucking end in disaster, isn't it? Do you walk like this? First of all, you need to know is that we're sanctioned by the government, so we're, we're not a mafia. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not a le illegal body. You're saying a government can never be a mafia. What I'm telling you is, by having an inventory, we're able to stabilize the prices. So a year that it's bad, we take the syrup from the inventory and we flood the markets to keep the prices down. Ever since we've put the system that we have in place, we've doubled our sales internationally in the last 10 years and tripled its value. To Normand, the Federation is a godsend, affording him higher profits and the ability to invest in new technology. It's a sentiment, he says, that the vast majority of producers in Quebec agree with. But resistance to the Federation's benevolent monopoly is growing, and producers like Angèle Grenier, who's been tapping her maple trees for 23 years, say the Federation is a den of thieves. The Federation, what happens is that they say that my syrup is their property. C'est un autocollant que la, la Fédération euh, acéricole du Québec vient installer deux à trois fois par semaine. Puis euh, eux ont le, la permission de briser mes serrures pour rentrer, pour venir vérifier mon sirop d'érable s'il est toujours ici, puis euh, remettre des styles. Those who have run afoul of the Federation have had their syrup seized, their sugar shacks outfitted with cameras and guards, and are subject to spot property inspections that don't require individual warrants. C'est une mafia du sirop d'érable. Perdu ma liberté de produire à partir du moment où que la Fédération a instauré l'agence de vente et les quotas. Between 2002 and 2014, Angèle defied the Federation's orders and sold her syrup to buyers in New Brunswick. She was caught multiple times. The result? A bill from the Federation that she estimates tops $500,000 and an appointment in front of Canada's Supreme Court. Si euh, j'abandonne ma Cour suprême, c'est ça, présentement, là, je vais tout perdre. Puis euh, tous les droits vont revenir à la Fédération. Il n'y aura plus aucun droit de liberté au Québec en agriculture. Angel is pinning her hopes on Hans Mercier. Before I started, you know, doing maple syrup law, which just takes a kind of an ex You do maple syrup law? Yeah. It's literally the most Canadian sentence I've ever heard exactly. in my life. Mercier has waged a long legal battle against the Federation, and he's added Angel to his roster of rebel clients. She wants to be able to trade without having to live with all the red tape of this unionized system, this legal cartel of maple syrup. They pride themselves in having approval rates over 90%. And I jokingly answer that's, you know, Saddam Hussein at these kind of approval rates. So you don't buy that they have 80%? I don't buy it at all. A lot of people say if it wasn't coerced, it wasn't obligatory to go in the system. The system would crumble. Simone Trapanier is the Federation's executive director. He says requiring producers to join FPAC is necessary to keep prices high. And he defends the Federation's controversial tactics against the rebels, for the most part. Are there any actions that you guys have taken against rebel producers that you regret? Yes. What are they? Putting guards in sugar shacks. You regret that? Yeah. It was not a good, uh, a good way of trying to convince those producers to working with the majority of them. Steve Cote is still not convinced. His property was one of those under 24-hour guard. Cote racked up hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines for selling syrup outside the Federation. In 2013 and 16, under pressure, he sold all of his syrup to FPAC but they didn't give him a cent in return. His profit, they said, would be applied to the fines he's accrued, including the cost of the guards. This year, a frustrated and broke Cote told the Federation he wouldn't be tapping any trees. But because of demand from individual consumers and a need to supplement his wife's meager income, he reversed that decision. As he was giving Vice News a tour of the sugar shack, an unmarked pickup truck rolled up the driveway. Salut. Oui. Produisez finalement. J'en ai entoyé 3000. Ben c'est pas ça. Ça dit quand il est venu là, ça fait trois semaines, un mois à peu près. C'était pas prévu non plus. Là, quand les gens commencent à appeler. 
You don't want to fight. Why not just say, I'll join this federation of producers and I'll make uh, a good amount of money and I wouldn't have any of this trouble? They offer a good price. That, I agree. But as an entrepreneur, I should be able to do whatever I want. You know, if I want to sell my syrup for a little less, or if I can't get a little more, I should be the one who decides, not them. When he's tapping trees, is that against the law? No. It's going to depend on the collaboration of uh, Mr. Kute. If he decides to show his, uh, his books and tell us where he sold his syrup, uh, then maybe uh, everything could, uh, could be good for 2007. That's Vice News Tonight for Wednesday, April 12th.